Hello and welcome to Real Talk on Renal Cancer, sponsored by the Judy Nicholson Kidney Cancer Foundation. I am so excited to um, welcome today Dr. Pablo Mazul, who is with MD Anderson and just a complete wonder in all things kidney cancer, especially the rare subtypes. Um, I had the honor of listening to um, Dr. Masool's talk at the Kidney Cancer Association's um, annual event in Knox in Nashville. I was thinking Knoxville, wrong Tennessee city in Nashville um, last year, whenever he received the Dr. Chris G. Wood Rising Star Award. And um, it was incredible. And I know that Dr. Masool has so many things to offer to the kidney cancer community and does a lot in rare subtypes in particular. And Dr. Masool, I just wanted to welcome you to the podcast and also find out, you know, just tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got started into uh, kidney cancer research and treatment. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me. So uh, my name is Pavel Misawal, and I am a physician scientist, um, meaning I run a lab and perform um, lab research and design and run clinical trials and see patients um, specifically with kidney cancer at MD Anderson in Houston. Um, my particular focus is the rare kidney cancer. So I would say half of the patients that I see in clinic have clear cell kidney cancer and the other half have any other subtypes of, of, of kidney cancer, ra ranging from rare to extremely rare. And, and the more challenging, the better. Um, and, uh, what, what, um, prompted me to, to focus on this field very honestly was, uh, my mentor Nizar Tanir, um, himself, a kidney cancer expert and rare kidney cancer aficionado at, uh, at MD Anderson. And it just so happened that when I was uh, a fellow here, I rotated in his clinic and he simply infused me with, uh, or infected me is probably the better word with his enthusiasm about uh, kidney cancer and rare kidney cancers in particular. I love that so much. And I don't know if you knew this, but um, Dr. Tanier is actually my mom's oncologist at MD Anderson. So I, I know Dr. Tanier very well and think the world of him and the work that he does for rare kidney cancers. And I know you, you, I think, I know we've talked before, but you know, I have a rare form as well, HLRCC. Um, and so it's nice to know that we have people in our corner fighting for these answers to non-clear cell kidney cancer, because as you know, there's the treatment options are, I don't have to tell you this, um, but for our listeners, the, can, the options aren't as, um, as vast as for clear cell. And so I think what really interests me about your research in particular was I heard your talk at one of the CDMRP events um, last year about renal, renal medullary carcinoma, which you know, is just such a, a terrible, devastating disease. And I know that you really have become one of the premier um, oncologists in the world, really, for RMC research. And maybe if you could help us kind of understand, Dr. Masool, what that looks like for um, someone who's diagnosed with renal medullary carcinoma um, and kind of why it's so rare and challenging to treat. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, the HLRCC connection is um, that when, when I was starting to, to, to think about these challenges, I was tremendously inspired by the work that the NCI has been doing, Ram Srinivasan, Marston Linehan, and others in um, non-clear cell kidney cancer, and particularly HLRCC. Like this show that you can actually design biology-driven research and trials for the so-called rare subtypes, which which was important because you know when I was looking to see um, what field I'm going to focus on, I did get the feedback not as much as MD Anderson, um, but you know um, I did get the feedback that this could be a career suicide and. It is scary sometimes, you know, because when 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 you tackle a rare and challenging cancer, very often you're just alone. It's just you. 
Um, and, 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 and that helps people understand a little bit the context about renal medullary carcinoma, abbreviated as RMC, which unfortunately is largely the deadliest of the kidney cancers, meaning if you don't treat it the right way, no matter the so-called states, practically all of it is, 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 is stage three or stage four. Um, and if you don't treat it correctly, it will kill you within three months on average. That's how deadly it is. Um, it is rare, but it is much more common than we used to think when I was a fellow. It's at least 10 times more common um, than we used to think. And it helped by raising awareness with efforts such as the one currently to get people get the right diagnosis in the United States and hopefully throughout the world, this will happen. It's a deadly kidney cancer, but the other challenge is that I believe it may actually be the only cancer I'm aware of that so specifically afflicts a minority, young individuals of African descent uh, in the US, mainly African Americans, and that is not because of a direct connection with race, but because it is connected with a blood disorder called sickle cell trait, which in most, most, most cases, it is completely benign. Half of my patients didn't even know they had it. Um, but there is 3 million people, mainly African-Americans in the United States that have it and 300 million people in the world, in Africa, India, et cetera, that have it. And all of them are actually at risk for, for developing this um, um, rare and deadly kidney cancer, RMC. Wow, and that is just so, in, it's so incredible to hear in like the worst way, because you know, I really relate it to what you said about how it is um, kind of lonely being in as a researcher and physician in these rare kidney cancers because I feel that way as a patient sometimes, right? To your point, HLRCC is also very rare and underdiagnosed, and there's um, not a lot of patients that connect with that have HLRCC. It's very low number. So RMC, I imagine, is even more challenging because to your point, it's so deadly and um, and so aggressive. You know, I was wondering, because I have, you know, people in my life that I'm close to that have sickle cell trait, and until I learned about RMC, I didn't know that there was a connection to your point, as most people don't. Is this something that um, there needs to be more awareness among, like, primary care physicians and others? Are they screening, you know, patients with sickle cell trait for RMC? Is there a way to kind of catch this before it gets to the point of a stage four diagnosis? A thousand percent. It's very important that awareness is raised in the sickle cell trait and disease communities about RMC. In not in, in in part because they also need to advocate for themselves. We're also obviously raising awareness, you know, in healthcare professionals, family physicians, ER physicians, urologists, oncologists, etc. But it's it's quintessential that patients also know about this so that they can advocate for themselves. It's uh, one of the um, stories that really hits home um, with regards to that is the story of Herman Connor, and it's on the internet. He allows us to use his name. He is one of it. It used to be he was actually the first patient that received second line therapy, meaning the first therapy stopped working, got the second line, and he's essentially cured from RMC. Um, again, there is now hope um, where it wasn't. So he's he's one of the very, 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 very first, and he hasn't had you know disease for a while. But when if you see his story, you will see how initially when he went to the ER, People, he had the mass on the kidney and they said, oh, you have some kind of nephropathy. They even mentioned HIV nephropathy, you know, like it, it was, doesn't even have, you know, it's like completely, completely bogus. And so I really think that raising um, awareness and making sure that people advocate for themselves is important. That's what Herman did. 
and he connected with Nizar and 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 said, "Hey, I have RMC. Can you help?" And and Nizar said, "Yeah." And then he came at MD Anderson, and he was able to be treated the right way. It's so important, also, because every other um, every every the therapies that we give for most of the other kidney cancers do not work at all against RMC. And the therapies that do work against RMC do not work against most of the other kidney cancers. That is why it's so important that you know that you have RMC or that you know that you have any of the specific subtypes. This applies to any subtype. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I encounter that in my own journey. You know, I also showed up, presented to the ER with a massive, you know, a tumor on my kidney that I had been going to the doctor for a year and a half, two years before knowing something was wrong. And I know I just was kind of um, brushed off. I think in part because of my age, I was 28, I was turned 29 right before I was diagnosed. And I know that this typically RMC is diagnosed in younger patients as well, correct? This is a, a very young disease for the most part. Yeah, exactly. Um, it can be as young as sometimes six years old, which is very rare. Usually patients on average, are they are in their mid-20s. It's extremely rare that they will be older than, let's say, 45. So it's a young population, often underserved. Uh, and, and you know, all, all of us, you know, when, when we were um, in, in, in our 20s, and many people still are, um, we didn't think too much about our health, um, including we didn't think about, hey, let me have the right insurance for, you know, cancer therapy, et cetera. So there is all this is the perfect storm of, of, of challenges in access, in knowledge, all of these things that, that, that made this hard. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I definitely was not thinking stage four cancer when I was diagnosed, um, as most people aren't. And I love what you said about how it's so important for patients to know their subtype, because I don't know that that's something, especially if you're diagnosed at an earlier stage and you know, you're seeing your urologist, you're not necessarily seeing a medical oncologist. Sometimes you don't get into the weeds and you know you don't know what your subtype is. And to your point, it really makes a difference as to what treatment that you get, especially with these rare subtypes. Um, so I'm, I really appreciate you saying that because I think it's important for you know our listeners who are patients and caregivers to know because you know it's so overwhelming whenever you're first diagnosed and you you're learning all these things at rapid speed, but then you really do need to know some things very quickly because it can impact how you respond to treatment. You know, um, I know that RMC has received a lot of press in the last year or so with Ronnie Hillman's case. Um, and even then there was some kind of misconceptions. I read some articles where they said, oh, he died of kidney and liver cancer and, you know, just some things that weren't really clear that it was a case of RMC. Um, you know, maybe for patients that, you know, either they, they know that they have um, this trait that could lead to RMC or for patients that, um, you know, are early diagnosed, you know, kind of maybe if you could share a little bit about kind of what you recommend for those early stages. I know you said it's really important to know what subtype you have. Um, I'm just, I always encourage patients to uh, get to, you know, a center of excellence like an MD Anderson where they have a rare subtype just because you guys see these patients uh, on a regular basis, right? Are there any things that other things that maybe our patients and caregivers should think of, especially when they're diagnosed with these rare subtypes? Yeah, no, in, in fact, and you're right, like every week in clinic, I see between three to five patients with RMC. The I think the largest number I've seen in one day is nine patients. So it's 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 like probably more than some oncologists see kidney cancer, period. Um, and, and it helps. It, it does help. As 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 you said, with regards to the sickle cell trait, it is actually something that a diagnosis that is done um, during childbirth, like when you're born, they actually check you for sickle cell trait. Now, I recently became a parent myself, and, and I can totally understand why you would miss it. <laughs> because it's so, so it's so overwhelming, you know, having, having a, a, a new child. Um, but this is an important thing to keep in mind, you know, having sickle cell trait, because when I was in medical school, um, I was 
wrongly taught that this is benign. In fact, one of the challenges that we faced um, years ago was exactly this resistance that, ah, oh, why should I learn that oh, sickle cell trait can cause RMC? I'm never going to encounter it. Well, if you encounter it once in your life, just once, and you are able to get the patient to the right people, you might change that person's life, which is why you went to medicine in the first place. And 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 so the the original reason why the sickle checking for sickle cell trait became mandatory throughout the United States was actually in part because of research done by the US Department of Defense in the late 70s interestingly why because they were noticing that um recruits were having sudden deaths and it could be for various reasons and they started doing autopsies and they noticed that the people that had the sickle cell trait had a higher percentage of these sudden deaths, um, sudden cardiac deaths. We don't know exactly the mechanism, although we can speculate, and it is very likely related to the same reason why RMC happens. Um, and 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 when that was discovered, essentially the connection is that very high intensity exercise, like the kind that you would have if you're a recruit or an athlete, if you're not careful could increase the damage in your heart or in your muscles or more commonly even in the kidneys and that damage in the kidneys is what causes rmc and it was a dod research again won a concept award um, that um, um, was funded for rmc that led us to make that connection for rmc where we realized that indeed about 60 to 70 percent of people that have sickle cell trait and develop RMC have a strong history of high intensity exercise. Now, that does not mean that if you have the trait, you should not exercise. On the contrary, the, the data we have suggests that if you're a sedentary, you have like, if you don't exercise at all, you have a certain risk. If you do moderate intensity exercise, and I will tell you uh, immediately the differences, then you may have the lowest risk of RMC. You may have the lowest damage, et cetera, et cetera, plus all of the other health benefits of exercise. And it's only when you do too high intensity exercise that you have the highest risk. And why is that? It is because... When you do moderate intensity exercise, you get the, the benefits of, you know, we believe the blood vessels dilating, et cetera, et cetera, that protect your kidneys. And high intensity exercise is, it's all actually, by the way, defined by the CDC. Because of the connection with sudden death that we knew for decades, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just go to the CDC on their page for sickle cell trait, and you read their recommendations about good hydration and good exercise and everything they say there apply to reduce your risk of RMC. And so when we say high intensity exercise, it's the one where you have a heart rate consistently above 160, let's say. And you're really sweaty when you're doing the exercise. You cannot even talk when, when you're doing this exercise. And moderate intensity, you know, your heart rate will be 120, 130, maybe a little bit of 150. And, 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 and you can talk, like when you do this exercise, you can actually talk to somebody else um, and you're not, you know, sweating like crazy. Now, you ever, people know that what may be high intensity initially becomes moderate intensity later, the more you condition yourself, like you do the right kind of initial conditioning and you can actually serve in the military. You can actually be a professional athlete. You can be all of these things as long as you start the right way to protect your kidneys when you have the trait. Yeah, I just, that talk that you gave um, to CDMRP was fascinating to your point. It came from that concept award that was funded by the DOD um, because I, I, you know, I, th I thought, well, that makes sense. You know, these patients like Ronnie Hillman, I mean, an NFL athlete, obviously doing high intensity exercises it makes sense. Although I am a little disappointed. I thought that you were going to say that means that we don't have to exercise. <laughs> I was really hoping for that, but. <laughs> no, it, it, it helps in so many ways. You know, even if every exercise was associated with RMC, which clearly it's not. And by the right. way, 
we are now prospectively looking to see both in patients and in our animal models what type of exercises are protective and, and not. And, and so in the coming years, we will be able to produ provide specific evidence even for that. But even if every type was increasing the risk of RMC, the overall benefit that the community gets from exercise, you know, with cardiovascular disease, with reducing other more common cancers, et cetera, still makes it worth it. But the good news is that no, the right kind of exercise may actually reduce the risk of all cancers, including RMC, plus the health benefits in the cardiovascular, diabetes, et cetera. That makes complete sense. Um, and thank you for sharing, because again, I just think that there's such a lack of awareness of, you know, of these things that, especially, like I said, patients that you know, our athletes are in the military, you know, that they are doing these high intensity um, exercises. A lot of times to your point, they don't know that they have this, you know, propensity to be getting this rare form of kidney cancer. So it's uh, really crucial that we say, hey, you can still do all of those things. You can still be an athlete or, you know, in law enforcement or in the, you know, in the military, but you just have to take these precautions. So thank you for helping us kind of get the word out about that. And, you know, Maybe if you don't mind sharing, if there are some things that still frustrate you about, you know, where we are with research. I mean, I feel like research has gotten so advanced in the last almost eight years since I was diagnosed, but I know there's still a lot of unknowns. Is there maybe a question that you're still just itching to find out the answer to or something that you really wish that we would focus on more as a research community? Well, um, the good news is that focusing on RMC is not a career suicide. In fact, um, we just got the, the final information that, you know, our team received, my lab received the uh, an R01 grant by the NIH. That's a, a very uh, big support, research support, the first of its kind for RMC specifically. Congratulations. And so, thank you. Thank you. And so this shows again that there can be academic recognition and success if you do things rigorously. Um, and it's actually much more fulfilling because it, it it helps you truly, truly make a difference. So I strongly, strongly, strongly advocate for people to do research in rare diseases. There is so many things that one can learn from these rare experiments of nature right. that then can help everyone else and i strongly encourage people obviously to do rmc research and that one of the things that i i, I enjoy is how, how now all of these discoveries are making people think and now they're contacting us you know from various institutions and they say well what do you think about this and what do you think about that i'm like yeah let's let's collaborate oh you do it on your own and let's brainstorm and and and, and that is fun and, and what this is leading to is it, it is a fact that people with RMC that three or four years ago would have been incurable, they're cured. So there are people, and even when they're not cured, they live longer with better quality of life. Our latest data of 135 patients with RMC seen at MD Anderson support a steady improvement in the survival outcomes of these patients, thanks to all of these efforts, raising awareness to diagnose it early, developing first-line therapy, second-line therapy, third-line therapy, strategies to eradicate the disease, which means that we are now able to cure, if we can use the word, it's, it's early because this is all new, um, up to even 10% of our patients. But what frustrates me is the other 90%. So the goal is to eradicate it. So that's what is really putting a, the fire in us, getting it to 100%. Now, again, we know this is difficult. We're not, you know, like uh, crazy. We've, we've dealt with the, the challenges, um, but we can also show the actual data and show yeah. how the outcomes are improving. And we've made specific predictions. The average survival right now is in the range of 18 months. Again, we went from three months to nine months in 2011 to 13 months in 2017 to 18 months 
today, which means that whereas in 2018, about half of the patients diagnosed with RMC will live for less than a year, today, almost everyone lives for more than a year. So 18 months, we said 2025, we're going to get it to two years. It's not going to be easy, but we want to put specific goals so that we're held accountable within sure. ourselves as well and, 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 and to motivate us to keep pushing and then to five years by 2030. And I, I, I wish, you know, I could say with confidence by 2025, we'll get it to 100%, but that's the ultimate goal. We sent you, we, we put specific um, goal posts and that's right. how we're going to move it forward. And that's how we're going to eradicate RMC. And that's how we're going to eradicate HLRCC. And that's how we're going to eradicate all of these cancers. I I just love that so much because, you know, I don't know that it's always, um, I don't know that it's always understood whenever, especially if you're early on in your journey as a cancer patient or a caregiver, that just how much progress has been made over the last few years. You know, to your point, I mean, I remember I was diagnosed, I remember looking at the stats going 5% to <laughs> make it to five years of the stage four diagnosis. Yikes, that's not a big number. Now we're at 10%, right? We're getting to 15%. And I know that you said, you know, three months, I mean, I hear three months to 18 months. I think that's incredible. That is, that's such a market progress. And, you know, really, I mean, just kudos to you and your team for, I know, being, making that happen because it wouldn't happen without the research of you and your team. Um, but I imagine for people just listening that maybe early on, they go, oh my gosh, only 18 months, right? But something that I remember hearing early on was, look, the goal is, to get you to live long enough on your current treatment to where by the time that that fails, the next one is already here. You know, and I imagine that's the case for not just HLRCC, but RMC and some of these other cancers as well, right? Absolutely. And in fact, the 18 months is an average. It right. is actually drawn also by the fact that some of these patients are cured. And again, right. that wasn't like, like cases that it was thought impossible to cure five or 10 years ago, because these are patients that are resistant to the first therapy. You know, we always, um, for the past 15 years, we we knew that a very, 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 very small proportion, if they got lucky and they responded to the first therapy, um, we, we, we could um, get a cure. But now we have meaningfully rendered what we call NED, no evidence of disease, disease-free or, or whatever, patients who were on the second therapy, third therapy, even fourth therapy with RMC. Again, not all of them. Um, it's, it's a small still proportion, but it is a progress and it would not, I, I cannot emphasize that, it would not have happened without our patient advocates pushing for this, advocating organizing themselves. That's the number one thing, making sure that patients know where to go, patients know um, 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 what to do, and, and, and sharing their experience because I, 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 I probably know everything, you know, scientifically known about RMC, but there is one aspect that I know very little, if at all, and that is what does it mean to be an actual patient or an actual caregiver with RMC. Like that's a completely different dimension where I think that other patients and advocates and caregivers can share that information and it helps immensely. It helps the care of patients, it helps the research, it helps everything. And again, I wanna emphasize how important it was for the patients that came before that so selflessly shared the research, participated in research. Now, and, 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 and that has to do, again, with sometimes there is this sense that certain communities are adverse, you know, resistant to research. Now, remember, 85% of my patients in my trials are Black. And so they participate immensely in research 
<laughs> they, they're like the reason why all of this happened. If they weren't excited and supportive right. of research, that, that, that wouldn't have happened. And so there is no excuse not to include, you know, patients, minorities, et cetera, in research. Because if, if, if you talk to people and you look at them straight in the eye and you're honest and you say, yeah, I get it. You know, things may have happened in the past that were wrong, but here is why we're doing this and why, et cetera. Oh, you're going to get so much support that is transformative. And our patient advocates through their passion and energy have given us ideas, have supported research. They've been quintessential partners in this journey. You're going to make me tear up, Dr. Masool. <laughs> no, but you're you're so right. And, um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm really glad that you said that because, you know, I go, as you know, to a lot of um, presentations, whether it's KCA or, you know, other organizations that do symposiums and, you know, I hear about how they say, oh, well, here's the barriers to getting patients to enroll in a clinical trial. And I was on a clinical trial. I, think, I know we've talked a little about my case before, but I was on a clinical trial and that's why I'm still here. And I'm such a big advocate for clinical trials because, you know, to your point, that's where we find the answers. That's where we find a lot of our answers to treatment and, you know, why, why these subtypes are the way that they are. Um, but, you know, I think that um, it's really important for providers to have those conversations with their patients about a clinical trial and to not and to present it in the right light like I love the way that you said that that you said look I look them in the eye talk to them about this is this is why it's important to do this I was luckily I had a similar experience with my late oncologist Dr. Vogelzang and you know he explained to me why he thought that clinical trial was the best option but I know there's sometimes a hesitancy with providers. Um, I've heard this from other providers. There's a hesitancy to talk about clinical trials or maybe, um, you know, there's some, some presumptions made. So are there any maybe uh, tips or tricks that you have that, you know, if you, if you are trying to figure out how to, it sounds like you kind of perfected a way to talk to patients and caregivers about clinical trials, but is there any kind of advice that you'd have for other providers on how to have those conversations? Yeah, um, and, and, and one, one um, key piece of advice um, is that even though I am absolutely a believer in research, when I take care of a patient, the first thing is the patient. It is right. their clinical care. So if it is going to help them clinically to not be in a trial. There is no way I'm going to put them in the trial, even if they beg me for it. Because, you know, sometimes patients come to MD Anderson exactly to enroll in trials, and it may not be the right thing for them. And I explain to them why a trial is not the right thing for you right now. And because, again, they are the number one priority. And once, once people realize that this is where you're coming from, then there is no there is no friction. It's it, it right. it's it's shared decision making. We incorporate the trial when it is the right thing to do, and 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 we will because trials are super important. They're very important part of the journey, as you know very well. And you you just have to position it at the right time for its patient. Thank you. I completely agree. Um, just one last question. I kind of want to go back to. I know that you had mentioned that. And I've heard this as well, that, you know, the way that you treat RMC is different from how we treat other kidney cancers, right? And so immunotherapy or targeted therapy that we would typically give for a patient that has a more common type of kidney cancer, um, I think is detrimental in most cases. Am I correct in, in assuming that? Are there? Yeah, it, absolutely. Yeah. In, in fact, one of the things that to our horror we discovered, and this is the value, by the way, of doing dedicated research. If we weren't doing trials specifically for RMC, we wouldn't have noticed it because the only way to see the pattern is to actually enroll consistently patients with RMC. If you just do a basket trial that include every subtype, you're going to miss it. I know it because these trials happen and, and it was missed. It, it, it would have been missed by us as well. What happened is that we discovered that immunotherapy the standard immunotherapy that's given for clear cell um, kidney cancer, for example, not only does not work against RMC, it may actually feed it. 
and 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 make it grow faster and we have some ideas of why that might be happening and also how to reverse it which is very exciting because those ideas might actually end up uh, uh, being more general because RMC has the advantage, let's say, of being very homogeneous, meaning being very similar. Every case is very similar, whereas more common cancers, they tend to have a lot of difference with each other. You know, there is clear cell kidney cancer and then there is clear cell kidney cancer, completely different, even though they have the same name. And so some clear cell kidney cancers or maybe some prostate cancers or even some bladder cancers may actually share with RMC these features that not only make it resistance, they may make things worse. And that's, again, the value of focusing on the rare diseases and finding these signals. The targeted therapies that were developed for clear cell RCC, for clear cell kidney cancer, of course, they're not going to work against RMC because they were never developed for RMC. The, they make the environment more hypoxic, they, 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 they take away the oxygen from mm -hmm. the kidney cancer cells, but the RMC cells were born from that hypoxia. Like that is their natural habitat. So you can give these therapies all you want. You're going to give patients side effects with zero. It's like giving a, a water to RMC, but, but RMC again has its own biology. So there are targeted therapies that do work against it. And the same applies potentially for every kidney cancer subtype. That's why every single subtype deserves its own panel of targeted therapies. Well, I couldn't agree more, <laughs> especially as a, as a rare subtype myself. I could not agree more. And I really appreciate your insight. Um, it's been incredible to hear more. I mean, I learned more about RMC today, um, which I thought I knew a lot and I just learned a lot more. And, you know, um, I really appreciate your passion for, you know, like you said, the, the dedicated um, personalized patient care and also what you're doing in the research lab is just phenomenal. So is there any last words, any, anything you want to leave our listeners with today that we haven't covered? Yeah, and again, thank you so much for having me. I, I want to emphasize again how important it is to know about your diagnosis, um, whether you have you know early stage or late stage disease, because the subtype that you have also um, impacts the prognosis, meaning the chances that your kidney cancer is going to come back, which means that it impacts the so-called surveillance strategy. How often do we need to do images? So at, at every stage, it's important, certainly when it's um, stage four, where we, we need um, tailored therapies. Um, the other key message I, I wanna emphasize again is how important what you're doing is. Um, it, it makes a tremendous difference. Again, nothing RMC related of the things we're doing at least would have happened without our advocates nothing. It's the patients, you know, they've got skin in the game. They catalyze things, they come up with useful ideas. Um, and it's also, I think, important, even for patients, many of them may not want to necessarily engage as advocates. But I do think it's always useful when they interact with the advocacy communities, when they share information, or when they they ask questions and then they come and meet me, for example, with with questions. I love it. I love it when patients, you know, have already been through the various social media, et cetera, and come in and say, what about this? And I'm like, ah, you know, it's 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 an interesting interaction. So I really, really want to emphasize this. Thank you. Yeah, I always say that knowledge is power and it's so important to you know, be the most knowledgeable person about your own body and your own case, um, especially to your point where you're dealing with a rare subtype. I mean, I'm sometimes, especially if I'm interacting with um, providers that aren't my, you know, my urologist or my oncologist, right? They may not know about HLRCC. And so I have to be the one to kind of bridge that gap. So I, you're absolutely right. And I really appreciate that insight. And, you know, again, thank you for what you do and congratulations on being a new parent. It's so exciting. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate um, it. 
Yeah, but this is this has been a phenomenal conversation. Again, I really appreciate your time. And, um, you know, please, for our listeners that are interested in learning more about Dr. Masul's research, please, um, you know, you can find more at MD Anderson's website. Um, I know we'll also post some on ours. But again, my name is Laura Esfeller. It's been an absolute honor and pleasure to speak with you today. And uh, this has been Real Talk on Renal Cancer, sponsored by the Judy Nicholson Kidney Cancer Foundation. Thank you so much, Dr. Masul. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.